we're recording. I uh, I just downloaded some new software here for our uh, national team uh, leadership and character development show. This is uh, episode 13. I'm back here with uh, Dr. Rick Adante. He's uh, in his office and uh, I'm in my home and just uh, returning from Bucharest. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if you're going to be seeing this uh, with me in a tiny screen and Rick Big here. Um, if not, we're going to figure this out. But uh, Skype uh, switch my software. Have you have you ever experienced one of those things where you have to copy the numbers or the letters and numbers that uh, that they put out when you mess up your password or something? It's it was quite the experience. It was it was a little traumatizing, really. It was because uh, I, I did it like eight times and I couldn't figure it out. But now we're we're recording. Uh, we're both. We I can see you. You can see me. So. Uh, how you doing, Rick? Pretty good, man. What's uh what's going on over there? How was Bucharest? Well, Bucharest was 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 really rough. We had we had a couple, you know, guys that uh competed pretty well. Um really like this young athlete, Nolan Baker. Just guy had an incredible uh attitude just just about the whole thing. Here, i you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna play the first couple minutes of this young man's uh interview. It was uh you know, pretty great perspective on this guy. Uh, let's see if we can. I don't... Nolan Baker came out here for your first world championships, came out here with a lot of aggression. <laughs> Talk about what your mindset was in coming to this tournament. Um, I didn't really know what to expect uh, out of my opponents. Obviously, I knew they were going to be the best in the world, but I hadn't really had experience with foreigners so far. So I knew that I just needed to come out and do what I knew I was capable of doing. I thought. I thought the only way that I would regret anything that I did this weekend is if I didn't leave it all out there and at least try my offense. So the main thing on my mind was just get to your offense, you know, win or lose the match by what you do. Don't let him him uh, dictate how the match goes. What kind of feeling do you leave this tournament with? Um, obviously, I wanted a medal. That's the whole reason for coming here. But at the same time, it's been the honor of a lifetime to represent my country and my family and bring the community around me together. So. I just I feel really uh, blessed to be in this position, and I felt like I battled my heart out, and so I'm leaving here with no regrets. I did all I could, and it just wasn't enough. This I really appreciated the way that young athlete, uh, you know, talked about you know just having the opportunity to get out there and compete and represent his country and his family, his his community, and just you know looking that, at this as as an opportunity and a blessing to. To you know, first of all, you know, be on a world team and and have that chance to to go represent the United States and uh, yeah, he wanted to get a medal. He wanted to stand on the on the podium and and see his flag raised. But uh, things didn't work out for Nolan. Uh, things didn't work out for a lot of our athletes this this weekend. Um, you know, we we didn't we didn't come out and create the action. We didn't take the matches to our opponents. We kind of let the matches come to us. Um, but you know, some guys like Nolan really did go out there and, and took the match. He, he created a lot of offense, uh, against a couple of very good opponents. Uh, he got pulled into Repishaz cause the first guy he lost to ended up making it to the finals. And then, uh, he lost the Japanese who ended up taking bronze. Um, so he lost to a couple of quality guys, but, uh, you know, just again, grateful for that opportunity. Yeah, I was really impressed by him. It seemed like he was very classy and very mature sort of understanding of the, the, the not just the challenge of the world and how tough those tournaments are, but also the opportunity that he had to, to go there and represent, you know, not just your team, but our country. And, I mean, obviously you know this. I'm, I'm just a fan of the team. You guys are, as a, just an American citizen, you know, it, it was inspiring to see him understand that, you know, he's out there representing all of us. And I thought that was a very, very classy way for him to wrap up that tournament. It's a, it's a very good perspective. Um, you know, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to, I'm going to try to create my offense. I'm going to battle my heart out and uh, give it everything I got. Uh, and some of our guys didn't do that. They didn't go out there. They kind of waited and let the matches come to them. And by the time, you know, they, they wanted to get into the fight, they were too, too many points down and, you know the the opponent had momentum going against them. You know if if you if they can smell blood, they're they're going to keep coming. Um, so yeah, I I think it was it was a lot of lessons learned this weekend. Um, but uh, lessons that you know I I would I would hope that we've already learned, but uh, we're we're still learning some of those lessons. And you know this is our our under twenty three age group. We had uh, 
you know, young Colton Schultz, who voted in his first election this November, uh, you know, he went out there and was competing against senior level men. And, you know, he, he went out there and, and pushed his opponent around, got into a couple of really good ties, um, got overpowered and uh, thrown. He didn't he didn't give up big points. He gave up two pointers on each of the throws. He, he floated uh, the throws, but that was enough to keep him out of contention from moving on to the next round. Um, you know, Tracy uh, Hancock, uh, one of our more talented guys, um, you know, he went out there and, you know, the, he wrestled pretty hard. He um, did some good actions that uh, should have resulted in points going his way. I think a couple of those were misjudged um, by the officials. Unfortunately, uh, you know, he was he wasted his challenge early on a on a one point uh, step out. And so when it when it came time to have an opportunity to challenge those calls and have them reviewed and looked at on film, um, he did, he lost that challenge opportunity. Oh, that's that's a bummer. Sounds like it's kind of one of those experience things. And like you said, you got you guys who just just voted uh, just for the first time. So you're going up against these, you know, experienced season season men from around the world and. I think that's what inspires me about what you guys got going on in your team is they're so young and there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful because a lot of some of those sort of experiential mistakes, they, they get ironed out with some of that seasoning over time and you kind of learn that stuff. And it's hard to, I mean, I've been on both sides of that coin when you were talking about the guys, you know, sometimes, I mean, I think we've all had matches where we didn't have enough offense at times or it was too late when we got going or something. And, Part of that, I think, just comes down to experience, and I think that you got these young guys. And how do you know? How do you know not to make that um, that appeal to the ref um, or not? As a, without the experience of trying it and failing, trying and succeeding, and you just need that time to build those sort of calluses. Um, that that I think what ends up making champions. So sounds like uh, sounds like there's a lot of good learning lessons and. And that Baker interview uh, just kind of really dialed that in for me, at least listening to what he was saying of having that good attitude and, you know, approaching it from that attitude of, of, of a learning attitude, right? It becomes the champion's attitude is they're not really losses. They're, they're learning opportunities. And sounds like, sounds like they're on the right track. I think so. I think for the most part, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's definitely hard to take because uh, I, I I know we got a lot of talent. We 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 have techniques. We know how to score points, but we we're not taking the fight to our opponent and creating push to where our opponents have to fight back into our offense. You know, if we're if we're kind of waiting for them to 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 come to us, they're they're getting their offense going. They're creating the push and and getting on their ties and getting to their angles of attack and. So it's it's just really something we've got to focus on as a program is, you know, creating that push from the beginning of the of the fight. Uh, you can see here on my on my bulletin board there, uh, it's the first thing on the list. Um, and every time I'm I'm designing a workout, you know, that's one of the things I I look at. You know, neutral push. Um, are we are we incorporating that into our into our training plan? Um, the neutral push are we creating angles of attack and then on bottom are we defending are we moving on bottom are we you know destroying the lock and then certainly on top i saw some incredible matches where guys got on top and they hit multiple combinations uh there was one match the guy was trailing six zero uh he got one opportunity on top he lifted his opponent uh three times for a total of 12 points and uh finished the match off um so you know, it was all the things that I'm I'm incorporating into our training are things that I'm seeing uh, work at the highest levels. Yeah, I mean, that sounds awesome. And I mean, like you said, it just seems like, I mean, I, I just know what it was like for me. There's times where I wasn't on offense. And then the times when, when I've seen success and when I've seen other people get success, I mean, you know, that you got to flip that switch to that mindset, that mindset about offense. And you know, taking taking the upper hand and be and, and looking to score, t being on offense as opposed to defense. I mean, it's hard to win anything if you're on defense all the time and you know, life, wrestling, whatever. And and it sounds like those are those are good areas that they're they know that they need to attack on that. And I mean, so 
uh, I mean, I remember watching you guys on track wrestling a couple of weeks beforehand at, at the Budapest games, right? So we were talking about Perez, but how about Budapest, man? You guys had a, had a huge medal with Kuhn pinning his way to the finals. And I tell you what, man, I'm sitting here watching matches at three in the morning, you know, and you see, I mean, Kuhn had that offense attitude he was going out there looking to score he was looking to looking to drive guys down and he wasn't intimidated from his first shot out there be at the world's at the senior level he was out there looking like a senior seasoned veteran of of looking for two reasons to score and getting excited and you can i don't know that's what it looked like on tv i mean what was that like for you guys man you guys had an awesome that's that's a huge deal well you know adam was willing to take the risk um to go out there and score. I mean, this, this sport it requires a lot of courage and you, you have to, I mean, courage just to, just to get out there and compete, uh, courage to, to put the kind of effort and training that it takes to get yourself to that level. Um, but certainly the courage to, to take risk and try to score points. And, you know, I, I, you, you know, you and I have talked a lot offline about, you know, the struggles that Adam went through and, you know, how, you know, how much of a, an adjustment he had to make this summer. And, you know, a guy like him that, you know, is used to winning a lot. You know, he went through college. He was, he was a multi-time all American. He was in the national finals um, of the, you know, the NCAAs and, you know, you know, winning big, big events um, at the college level and then, and then stepping up to that senior level and not, not being quite sure if he, if he felt like he was there a couple of times, you know, and there was some, some blood, some sweat, some tears, and and frustration throughout throughout the 17 weeks we had from when he made the team to he competed at the World Championships. But that's a guy that you know mentally knew how to put that together and perform at at the right time. You know, and all those training opportunities, the the pre World Tournament that you know he he got beat at, uh, you know, all those things helped him you know, figure out that he wanted to do this at the world championships and put together a game plan, a strategy, and really stuck to his game plan um, throughout the entire tournament. I think in in the last match, you know, he got a little anxious. What what was working worked really well because he was he was pushing his opponents around, moving them. And then when he saw that opening, he went for his locks and and he scored those body locks. And you know, pretty much every match it was it was a body lock, but he finished them differently every time. He crunched guys down, he threw them, um, he twisted them. You know, he he finished with different types of finishes in each of those situations, but all always from his dominant position. Awesome to watch. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm just a fan. I'm a coon squad man. I gotta find me a t-shirt, whatever it is, man. He was it was awesome. And like I remember watching him through this year, and, and we got a chance to hang out with him in Tulsa at the trials before yeah. that in, in the summer. And you know, getting to talk to him and see that the success that he had with you guys in Budapest at the Worlds, it was like, you know, he actually I mean, I was I I wanted to nominate him for like wrestler of the year for usa because i mean he he pinned his way to the finals which is 
almost unprecedented as far as I'm aware, at least in Greco. It was amazing. But what was also really impressive to me wasn't all the success he had. I mean, he right because he beat Kyle Snyder earlier in the year, right? Olympic champ, world champ. He beat a lot of people and did a lot of stuff. But also, now that you got me talk, thinking about it, he actually had a lot of adversity that year. He also lost to Kyle Snyder. He lost to Gwiz. Um, he lost, you know, he lost a lot that year. And the he setbacks did. that he had to deal with, right, in, in trying to be the best in the world, but yet not even being the best in the NCAA. Um, I mean, that now that I think about it, that adversity – seemed to really season him with that maturity and how to handle some of those temporary setbacks. And it seems like he always kept that learning attitude, that positive attitude of, you know, this doesn't have to define me. He had confidence and faith in himself of what his capabilities were. And he kept training even through those setbacks, whether it was that match he was losing, um, you know, in, in, the, in Europe beforehand uh, for the world or whatever that was. That's what's so impressive to me is that, like you said, he had the courage to train the courage to step outside his comfort zone and really dial in full to Greco when he needed to, but also to, to overcome that adversity. And to, I think it takes courage to stick to his game plan. Like you said, in the, in the tournament, I mean, so when you're taking a deep waters, Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. Right. And that takes courage to stick to your game plan when maybe it seems like it's not working. And maybe you're in those camps in, in, in Europe and, and things are struggling, but he had to me exuded, um that that seasoned maturity of not not giving up with the game plan and sticking with it and having faith in his coaches having faith in the plan i mean how valuable is that in, in an athlete for you as as a national team coach well i think it's 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 critical that that all our athletes you know really develop that growth mindset um you know the the understand that you know where you're at now is not where you can be tomorrow the next day next week next year um, you know, you're constantly growing, you're constantly improving. Um, now, you know, never looking at yourself as, as what, where I'm at right now is the best I'm going to be because, you know, I, I'm basing everything on talent. If I base everything on effort and hard work and dedication, you know, you can, you can really improve and you can improve in a very short time like Adam did. Um, you know, he's a big man. He's a strong, he's a strong athletic guy. Uh, but he really wrestled to his strengths. He he figured out what his strengths were this summer, and uh, you know we we really did hone in on that game plan. We had a moment uh, the last few weeks in our camp in Tata where you know he he wanted to come in just with one training partner, close the doors, and have a have a closed door practice where he wanted to just really hone in and develop that game plan. And he did that with a couple coaches in the room and. Uh, you know, he solidified what his plan was, and he just said, "You know, this is what I'm doing at the Worlds." And he was he was actually able to execute that in every every single match. Um, the Russian in the finals got to his body a little sooner. You know, he'd seen him throwing guys and pinning guys all tournament, and uh, figured, you know, hey, I better go first before this big guy gets a hold of me and and gets his lock. Um, you know, and we got right back up, fought off our back, and. Uh, you know, he went right back into that position, and uh, you know, he got he got scored on again. But uh, very impressive, uh, like you said. I mean, certainly uh, Greco Roman Athlete of the Year, uh, Freestyle had a, a very impressive performance as well. Yeah. Uh, they they might have a few Athletes of the Year for Freestyle. Um, very impressive um, team performance for the United States. Um, we broke some records for the entire United States and. Greco Roman was was a part of helping uh, break those records this year, and you know we were happy to to have our first finalist since uh, 2006. Since 2006, so uh, you know when you when you're talking about that that T-shirt for for Coon, you know I I, I was thinking of the uh, the South Park skit, you know the Coon, <laughs> you know with Cartman, you know, yeah. and, and uh, Adam's got a little bit of Cartman in him, you know he's he's you know he's kind of funny like that. Uh, He's he's a character. He's he's a really fun guy to work with. Uh, he doesn't take himself too serious. Uh, you know, he's got an ability to to laugh at himself and uh, use self-deprecating humor. And uh, you know, he, he really has has life in perspective. And uh, you know, that's that's another guy that you you listen to his interview after the World Championships and you know, especially right after his his loss in the finals. Um, you know, just 
grateful for that opportunity to, to be out on the mat and uh, have that chance to compete and represent the United States. Uh, the same kind of message that we heard from Nolan Baker. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll probably try, try to slice both those interviews into this, uh, the, the final production on this, uh, this podcast. And I don't know how this one's going to turn out uh, edited because I'm, I'm tiny over here, but, but maybe. <laughs> you know, up until that match, I'd say you almost even equal in that match. It was just an amazing experience, just all around. Just being able to go out and just compete with everything I have, with every you know God-given talent that I got. Just be able to push the pace and wrestle my wrestling, and just to be out here in the international scene again is just the whole experience is just a fantastic opportunity just to be out here competing in the sport I love. It's been just, a busy summer. It's been a very busy summer. It's been a long summer, and I put in. A lot of work this summer. Um, I'm tons better. Uh, it's been it's been a grueling camp. It's been grueling going through all the summer. Uh, it's been hard being away from home, but after a tournament like this, it makes it worth it. It's definitely grueling, but you know sometimes that's the stuff you got to get done to get to that on the podium. It's good to get to get a chance to sit down and, and talk, Rick, because uh, you know we had some some topics today that we wanted to go over and, and talk about, and it was. A lot of it is about developing the, the right culture for your team. And uh, I know you've had some experience as well uh, when, when you were in coaching in New Jersey. Uh, do you want to share some of that with us? Uh, sure. Yeah. I know, I know I was really inspired by what you guys were doing in Budapest. Uh, you know, when, when Adam finished up that tournament, like you said, and, and talked about his, his journey and, and how it ended and, and how he succeeded with it. I mean, I mean he made – he made me proud to be an American as a fan watching back here in the States. And I know he made, you know, thousands of other people proud of, of him and our, our country. So I appreciate his efforts to, to do that sort of classy wrap up for the, the tournament and just inspired all of us with what you guys did. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I got thinking about a lot of that during the tournament and, and I remember about the same time as the tournament, I was watching, uh, a short interview clip of Henry Cejudo telling his story about when he was training for the gold medal for Beijing. And he said something about that, that brands was, was pushing him really, really hard, which isn't very surprising uh, based on if anybody knows brands style, right? He pushes people pretty hard because you kind of need to be, especially at this sport at that level. And Henry basically made a comment that, you know, that what seemed to separate Henry at that time was especially as a young kid is is he believed brands he bought into it and and he bought into it a hundred percent and he didn't question it and he said something like there were other guys in the room that that didn't buy in fully and well there was a lot of other guys on that team that didn't get get a, a medal that year he was the only he was the only one in 2004 that uh, was on the podium there yeah, and so it just got me thinking about that because, I mean, the, the experience I had when I, I was coaching New Jersey, I started a new wrestling team uh, at a brand new high school. Uh, so we sort of founded it and, and you know, from scratch in an area in Mercer County that historically was the very worst county in New Jersey, which Jersey's a great state for wrestling, but that county was historically really, really weak. Um, you know, area where there's Princeton, Trenton, some, some good talents at times, but just culturally – it was not a wrestling culture at the level that you had, you know, Southern at Blair Academy at all the, all these powerhouses at the national level. And so it was a real challenge for us that year. I had freshmen and we were wrestling a varsity schedule. And so I had to kind of overcome this cultural uh, change that needed to happen. And what I needed to do is I needed to get those guys to buy in the way that Henry was talking about. And, you know, particularly to buy in, against their expectations of what should have been normal, what should have been, you know, uh, sort of expected levels of what it takes to succeed. Cause they were pretty successful in say junior high, but as you, everybody knows, right. What it takes to succeed in high school is a whole lot different than what it takes to succeed in junior high. And I was looking at what you guys were doing at the world. And I'm thinking maybe that's the same kind of thing. Maybe what it takes to succeed in the world level is a, lot, is a whole lot different than what it takes to succeed to the, be the best in America particularly in Greco based on the stylistic differences. So it just kind of got me thinking about that and, you know, what it takes to kind of change, change a culture. It's really tough. And it takes kind of a team effort between both the teacher and the student, between the coach and the athlete, because everyone has to be on the same page and you don't start on the same page. 
and it's sort of a gradual process but you know moving from sort of uh a culture where we might think we're excellent but which in which we're maybe mediocre and having to move to a culture in which we actually achieve that excellence is is a monumental effort and and it's really tough and i see you guys doing it you're you, you're getting these medals now you guys are, are, are reaching that excellence that that we want to see at, at, you know at a, at a routine level and um it just reminded me of what you guys are going through and and seeing the work that you guys are doing and building greco into to that consistency of of world medals and we're seeing it at the junior level with kamal won we saw it with colton when he won and i think that you guys are you know, inspiring and how you're moving that direction. Well, it, it is, a, it is a lot different because I mean, you're, you're every year we're going to have 10, 10 guys on the team. We're going to have 10 national champions. We're going to have 10 world team members every, every year that we have 10 weight classes. This is the first year that we've had 10 weight classes. If we have eight weight class, we're going to have eight, eight team members. Um, so, I mean, it, it is, it is pretty impressive to be the best guy in the United States. It's um, it's it's quite an accomplishment, but uh, the expectations are, especially in the United States, and and you know when we when we look at our our counterparts in freestyle, and, and they're you know they're winning multiple medals. Would would they end up with seven this year? Uh, seven out of ten ten weight classes they medaled in. Um, so the expectations are, are very high. I mean, completely different dynamics, uh, completely different culture that, you know, they're coming from a system that is geared towards leg grabbing and bend over stance and not creating push, um, kind of, kind of attack, counter attack in and out kind of attack, uh, rather than, you know, constant pressure on your opponent. There's nowhere to rest in, in Greco, you know, and, the minute you you try to try to find that spot to rest is is right when your your opponent capitalizes on that opportunity. Um, so it, it it requires a much more fighting spirit. Um, you know the the freestyle guys are just beautiful artists. You know they they're they're slick guys. They're in and out, but they they don't have to have that same amount of grit and fight um, to be successful. Um, so well, I guess go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that one of the challenges that um, that Greco might be dealing with too is that some of those freestyle guys might have already built that grit and resilience, but by just the seasoning of of maybe having a couple more years under their belt from college and other things like that, where you know you guys are kind of sidestepping some of that process for some of the guys, and you kind of it needs to not just you know do your normal training, but there's a normal developmental process of building that grit, building that resilience, and um, I think that that kind of goes unappreciated sometimes. I, I think that there's a huge advantage to having the guys um, on the freestyle team come through that, you know, developmental system of, of folk style. You know, it's, it's a, it's a really good age group tournament. It's, it's a tough, you know, you got the best, you know, college wrestlers in the United States all fighting it out. You know, you got 77 programs and you're trying to figure out who the best, you know, seven or 10 guys are in, you know, to make that all American ladder. Um, there's always going to be somebody at the top of that. And, and those usually the guys that are, are making that freestyle team are the guys that are somewhere at the top of that ladder, uh, multiple times, usually, uh, typically, um, I think Kyle, uh, Kyle Snyder, you know, was he in the finals, you know, all four years in a row, won it three times, uh, Kyle Dank, um, was the first guy to ever win it all four years in four different weight classes. You know, Burroughs is a multi-time champ. Uh, you know, you look up and down that lineup of the athletes that they have in that program, and you know they've figured out how to get to the top of that level. Now, now it's just it's just repeat. You know, I I remember when I was when I was uh, finally moved up a weight class. I it, it wasn't that I was I was scared to move up a weight class. Um, it was that I I knew how to beat the guys at my weight class. I'd studied them, I'd scouted them, and and I didn't want to do you know I didn't want to go up in, into this unknown world of okay I know I can beat everybody at seventy six kilo, and it, it was a it was a matter of I'm going to stay here even though I think I've grown out of this weight class I'm going to stay at seventy six because I, I I know how to beat these guys I, I've I've competed against them I figured them out. 
Um, but when I finally said, Hey, I'm, I'm done cutting weight because this isn't healthy for my body. I've grown out of this weight class. Um, if I make the team great, if, if, if I, you know, if I don't, you know, I, I'm going to give it my best effort. Um, that was probably the most fun I've ever had, uh, in the sport was, you know, wrestling, uh, where I, where I showed up a kilo under, but what I, what I did was I knew, I knew the process of how to, how to scout those opponents. I knew the process of how to, how to analyze my opponents and study the film. And so when I actually did make the move, it wasn't that I had to learn the whole process over. I just had to, I just had to learn each opponent that I was going to compete against. So I, I developed that skill set along the way. And then when I moved up a weight class, I just, I just transferred that skill set. And that's what these, these athletes are doing. They, they've learned how to develop that, that work ethic, the, the resiliency, the hard work, the, you know, the, the technique might be different technique. They're not riding guys in, in freestyle. They're, they're lace ankle and them or, or gut wrenching them, but they know the process of how to train and how to prepare. And it, it's, it's not just the different skill sets. Um, it, it's knowing how to, how to get to that level, get to the highest level of wherever you're at. Like your guys that, that you talked about, that they were pretty good junior high wrestlers. They got into high school. It was a whole nother level uh, for them. And you had to teach them, hey, you guys know this process and what it takes, but you have to follow this model. And uh, I think I think that's really what it takes. And so when you, you're capturing these athletes out of high school, we have a dual path, obviously, you know, with Adam coming through the college system. And we've, you know, we've, we've definitely, you know, done our – our effort and due diligence to try to recruit a lot of these freestyle athletes. There's just so many good environments for, for freestylers right now to be in the college programs alongside the regional training centers. And so we're looking at that model. And as we're developing more regional training centers, I don't know if you had even saw the news that Ohio state is hiring Dennis Hall to be a part of their regional training center. So I mean we're we're looking at that same model and going okay this is working great for freestyle how can we how can we join in how can we get involved and you know when I came on board here in in fourteen and fifteen I was you know really focused on developing a, a, a RTC in Ithaca New York this year we had a world team member out of there he he ended up injured didn't compete uh, this year but we also had a junior world champion a Andrew Berriasi out of that same program. Uh, so, you know, it's was, it was really, you know, shows that this model does work. Um, and in the last year or so, we, we've added multiple other RTCs with, with Stanford and Illinois and Chicago. And, you know, just in the last couple of weeks, they announced uh, Ohio State uh, hiring Dennis Hall and being a part of that regional training center. So, so we do know that that works, you know, getting guys from the college system because the colleges have developed that that work ethic, that knowing how to, to train, knowing how to prepare, um, you know, that seasoning, those lessons that you, you can learn from another realm in your life. Um, and, I, you know, hopefully a lot of these lessons don't have to be repeated. It, it's definitely hard when you tell guys, you know, here's some lessons that, that, you know, I want you to understand, but it's always the way that we always need to experience these lessons on our own to really yeah. learn them and, and have them sink in. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard because I want to tell these guys, you know, here's, here's what to expect. Here's, you know, here's the lessons, you know, I don't want you to learn the hard way. But uh, a lot of times it seems like they, you know, they insist. And uh, I think that's just human nature. I think we, you know, we understand it a lot better when, when we go through those, those same trials and, and we have feel those emotions because emotions really, um, they make us change. You know, we don't want to feel that way again. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's something for me that it seemed really evident in some of that, what might seem like sort of senior maturity I saw in, in, in Kuhn's trajectory winning through that tournament was it seemed he had that grit uh, through the training process through the summer that seemed to come from his experience uh, working through the, the college or RTC process that I think seemed beneficial for him in that, that these younger guys are developing, right? They're building that right now too, at the same time. You know, they, I think they are sometimes, but, but there's, there's moments where I think, you know, things get really hard and, uh, 
some some of the guys want to just they want they want to pull out. It's you know I don't need I don't need to train this hard. Uh, I need more more rest. I need more recovery. Uh, I mean that's a it's a big you know I mean it, it is important to have rest and recovery. You know, but when when you do have rest and recovery, are you are you actually resting and recovering? Or are you staying up late playing video games? Or are you yeah. uh, out going to movies or casinos? Well, that's kind of or... that's kind of what I was talking about when I was talking about changing cultures through expectations or the expectations of of cultures making that shift to the next level. Because because I see that in multiple domains. I've seen it coaching and wrestling. I see it now uh, teaching neuroscience actually. So I. I, I have the job now at, at Cal State San Bernardino, and we've never really had a cognitive neuroscience program here. And now I'm starting to build and teach these classes to students who've never had this kind of background uh, in, in neuroscience. And we know nationally speaking, right, there's this epidemic of, of students who are grossly unprepared in math and sciences across the country by the public school systems. And, and so it's my job to basically train these people that could be up at the college level to get them ready for a graduate level or world level, um, you know, abilities with some of this uh, neurobiology content, for example. And so I draw a lot of parallels with what I've seen as a teacher and as a coach as well in wrestling, because, you know, um, that's, I think, some of the, some of the expectations I see are where, that cultural shift has to happen because so our job as coaches and teachers I, I find right is is making that communication and getting people to buy into the idea that you know like you said like there's might be an expectation that i need more rest or this or that and i think you and i are both in huge agreement that rest is an amazingly important thing you shouldn't skimp on it it's really really important but i think sometimes as we climb that level metaphorically from junior high to high school right um, what we think we need isn't really what we need sometimes. And I think that's where it's really important to rely on good coaching, good teachers, because I see this with my students and say neuroscience, um, they come to my class and they've never had a neuroscience class before. In fact, most of their classes that they've had, um, require them to say, write a lot of essays or things that allow them to score points on tests or projects simply by virtue of having an opinion. If you write, even if you get the answer wrong, you still get some points for writing something. And instead, I, I, this is a, a sort of a very discreet class I teach in neuroscience where the answer is either right or wrong. And we have multiple choice questions, just like it is on the, the FAA flight exam. I modeled it very similar. The, you have to get the answer right or wrong if you wanna be a pilot. You have to be the answer right or wrong if you wanna be a neurobiologist or a doctor. And you know, just like in wrestling, right? You got to well, win. There's, or you, there's or, consequences if you don't know the answer. Well, yeah, and and right. So it's it's very much a model where this is the first time academically or scientifically that there people are kind of held accountable for being having a wrong answer and getting zero points. So it's kind of like the idea of um, getting participation trophies for a tournament versus actually having to weigh in and then wrestle to to get a medal. And so I'm, I experience a lot of students over time for lot, geez, years and years now, and it's pretty routine. They come into the class and they're not very experienced with these kind of things, and they have different expectations. So the expectation, for example, this is the amount of hours that it took me to study per week to succeed, and I got A's in high school. So therefore, that's what works for me. I know that works for me. I can study three to four hours a week on this topic and on a really heavy week, and, and that'll get me an A. Well, here's the deal. At college-level neuroscience, uh, three to four hours a week studying, um, that's not even enough sometimes to get a C, maybe a D. And so that might have been enough to get an A early in, but now um, that's that doesn't even cut it. I mean, our school has a, a minimum expectation of about eight hours a week outside of class studying. That's about two hours a night for five day, days a week um, for just to pass the class as a normal level, about a C, 75. You know, you want to excel, you want to be the best. You're going to be upwards of 10, 12 hours a week, maybe that you should expect. Now, that's what I'm talking about in terms of changing cultures, changing expectations, because that is not any of my students' expectations when they come into the class, even though it's in our university's registration bulletin. So kids are basically growing up through, say, public education systems or early introductory college classes where they're kind of sandbagged. And people are doing them a disservice by telling them they're doing a great job at an A level, even though they're doing C to D level preparation. And now you come into the real deal. You go from the national level to the world level, right? Uh, you go to, you're stepping up to, 
to the next level. And you have to have the answer right or wrong. And what you did earlier at younger levels to get the answer mostly right, guess what? If it's mostly right, it's still wrong. It's got to be all right. You've got, it's, you know, and, and that's a problem. And so students struggle with it at first, but we've identified, we know about it. We've built in mechanisms to build that up and teach that, but it requires changing the expectation. So like you said, oh, I, I got to rest tonight or whatever. And it's like, so no. Do you, do, you need, do you need to fail? Do you need to get that, that F on that first test before you get the message? Do you need to get, you well, know, how else do you know get, that get that beating at the world championships before you, because, because what I'm hearing from you are the same things that I hear is I know what it takes. I, I, I'm, I'm a young athlete that's been to one world championships or, or this is my first world championships, but I know what it takes to prepare. And this is too much and I need more, I need more rest and, and we're not tapering early enough or, you know, whatever, whatever those answers are, I know what it takes. And yeah, no, I hear it all the time. We hear, I think that there's a generational thing, like I was saying, right. They, and I think that, um, yeah, I see it all the time. And in the simple sort of answer that, that I'll try to expand upon though, the simple answer is, well, if, if you know what it takes, then, then you don't need a coach, just go do it. Just go, just go do your thing and, and come see me in Bucharest and in, in Budapest, or I'll see you in Tokyo 2020. If you don't need this, then we shouldn't, we, we can save a lot of money. We won't pay any coaches anywhere. You just do you. Right. But that's, I think that's the problem. Right. And, 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 and we know it's the problem, right? That's why we have teachers and coaches and, and people who have the wisdom of experience. We've done it wrong. I've done it wrong. I, I know you've probably done it wrong at times. I don't know. You've, You've got an Olympic medal, so you've done it right. But like we you know, know but, how to, but I, I but I went to doing it wrong. I went to three world championships before I got I got it right and at the Olympic Games. Yeah, um, so you know what you know what didn't work, and you know how to guide people to what does work, right? And so you have that what I would call that seasoning, right? That that maturity, that seasoning to be able to help guys that I try to do in the classroom with people in science as well, right? I've I've screwed up a ton of tests. I've I've done things wrong and we've learned how to do it right. And so when I see that attitude, I think it's very pervasive in, in sort of the, the modern generation because they're, they're raised to think that they do know how to do it right. And I think part of that is I think there's a lack of courage at times in the, in the, early, the lower levels to the, of the courage it takes to train people. That is the courage to tell the students, hey, that's not good enough. We got to push you beyond your comfort zone. We got to stretch you because I know you can do it. Because I know what your potential is, and I know your potential is more than this. But guess what? If I'm gonna, ha I need courage to do that as an instructor or as a coach. Because guess what? That's gonna take. That's gonna take pushing someone beyond their comfort zone. That means they're gonna be uncomfortable. That means they might be grumpy. That might, be, but sometimes that might, they might be sore and in pain if they're wrestling. They might just be uncomfortable and, and irritable and stressed if it's academics. But what it also takes is courage from a teacher or a coach. Is now you gotta have the courage to deal with the parent to deal with the administrator, to deal with everybody else who doesn't want to pay the price of a slow growth process that it takes to season, to really excel at, the, at those next levels. And so instead, nobody pick, wants to pay that price. We give everyone a participation trophy in the tournament, or we give everybody an inflated grade at a younger level. And now they all think that, that those two hours I studied that week, that's enough to get A's. No, it's not. It's not. That those two hours you spent training in the weight room, no, that's not enough two hours a week to supplement your training practice. Whatever that is, oh, you, you studied film for two hours a week. That's great. Guess what? What'd you do the other four days a week? That should be two hours a week. Whatever that is, that's that. Those are those expectations culturally that I'm saying that. That in my experience, in several domains, wrestling, neuroscience, all sorts of things, starting at areas where the region is not known for having a strong foundation in this thing and building it to a level that is strong those are the expectations that need to change what that is what are the expectations for training i think the college guys bring that to the table sometimes you know who knows what it takes to train because he's been through the resilience of losses to snyder and Guiz, and, and he's gone through that whole long season like dake has like taylor has like burroughs has like all you guys did coming out of college that has that inherent understanding i think when you deal with some of the some of the younger guys sometimes or students that that's just where some learning happens so i structure that into class and like you ask 
does it take to failing? It absolutely does. And so everybody typically gets crushed on my tests at first. And then what we do is we build in the system where I say, okay, now they think it's me. They think I did something wrong. It's a bad test, this and that. I said, how about this? I'll give you credit back on your missed questions, but you got to go back right out. Why was the question wrong? Then find, tell me right out in hand, why was the wrong answer that you gave wrong? And why per chance was the right answer happened to be right? And show me the page number. You have to write down the page number in the book the textbook where it said that true answer because they only put in a short amount of time and they don't think the answer was in the book and they think it was a trick question. And it takes a little bit of this practice, this exercise. They go back and they go, oh yeah, okay, there it was. I missed it. I just didn't study enough to do it. And it's a very good self-awareness training program. And they come back and they, they respond, I want to create a study plan that's going to make it so that I don't miss these easy questions again. Because they right, ended right. up being easy. It's just that their expectations were very different. Well, I, I, so, I, I've read some of the uh, some of the the things that your students had said about you, and one I got a, a big laugh out of was the 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 one in the the back that was asking you just to grade it on a curve, <laughs> and, and 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 the other students didn't want to didn't want to listen to the discussion, <laughs> but you really wanted to, to go down that road to explain this. You wanted to take the time. To really explain this and and so they had an understanding of what that expectation was and you weren't going to let them off the hook because it wasn't going to do them any favors and that's the same struggle that I have is is that I I, I don't want to let these guys off the hook but you know they have to want to be held accountable as well if if I want to hold them accountable but they they don't want to be held accountable I, I can't force somebody to um, you know, there's, there's, there's what's called the Ted Stevens Act where everybody, you know, after they go through the process, we're, we're both very familiar with that act. Uh, but as they go through that process and they, they earn that spot on the team, they have certain rights, inherent rights within there. And, and they don't have to, to follow the plan. They could, like you said, just show up at the event, but I don't think that's going to help them get the best results. So, you know, it, Either they're gonna they're gonna have to get on on the program and follow the plan, or they are gonna have to do it themselves. There's not gonna be this a la carte menu where they're able to pick and choose what they like about the training plan or what they don't like. Because there's gonna be things that you're not gonna like. There's gonna be times where you're uncomfortable, you're out of your comfort zone. This is hard, and that's really what it takes. This is hard to to be the best in the world at anything. To be the best of the world at anything. I mean, I, I can tell you just just to get get on the water and do what I want to do in kayaking. And I, I'm not trying to be the best in the world. I'm just trying to get down the river without swimming. Uh, <laughs> and and you know, I I learned really quick. You know, I I I I, I was coached how to raft and and race whitewater. And the river started getting low, and we couldn't get rafts down the river, so. I decided to jump in a kayak and I figured, well, it's got to be very similar. It's just the same. I, I read the water the same. There are a lot of similarities, but it's, it's re really the equivalent of going from Greco, from folk style to Greco Roman. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's this huge shift in techniques and, and, and body awareness and positioning. And when I'm swimming in the river, the only thing I can think of is I need to get a coach. And, and when I get a coach, I need to listen to that coach. Well, that's the buy-in that, that Henry reminded me of. In that little clip Henry was talking about with Brands, he's like, I'm the only one who made, won a medal in Beijing. I'm the only one who bought into what Brands was selling. And everyone thought Brands was nuts. He's like, I, I believed him. He's like, I was just as nuts. But the, he, you know, Tom seemed, and I don't know him personally, but he, it seems like he knew how hard this was. And Henry believed him. How I mean, it was hard Terry it was. at that time, but but or, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, uh, yeah. I'm sure I'm not the first one yeah. to have confused the two. No, but, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but uh, but but, but you know what my coach made me do was was things I didn't want to do. I wanted to run whitewater, and what what he wanted me to do <laughs> was skills and drills and and yeah. You know, I, I'm not even. I haven't even traveled like a quarter mile. I just keep paddling, grab an eddy, paddle up river, work this rapid over and over and over, in and out of eddy lines, 
get flipped over, get my roll. And, and it was just these constantly, these skills of, of bow draws, stern draws, and technique and skill development and conditioning your body and your, your, your mind and your awareness. And that was not why I got into to kayaking. To, to do skills and drills. I got yeah. into kayaking to run whitewater and, and I mean, huck myself over waterfalls, but I also want to live too. So <laughs> I, I, I realized, A, I need to get this coach and I need to do these drills and I need to do these skills and condition my body and, and to get to a point where I am even just capable of doing that. And I'm not even trying to be the best in the world. Yeah, I mean, so one, I'll push push back on what we said about a few months ago when you were talking about planning versus just going. I'd say that that shows that you're actually a planner even though you don't think you are because uh, <laughs> you, you actually knew you had to plan to go do it. Well, but, well if uh, <laughs> anybody's been following any of these episodes, they will remember that, that we talked about that. But it was, okay, I'm going to figure this out. And, and yeah. there became a moment in my in my where figuring it out meant – getting somebody that's got the experience, somebody that's been there, done that yeah. and, and listen to them. That's the, that's the part of go. Yeah. And I think that's the buy-in I was talking to. So when I was coaching these, these kids, right. Um, you know, they, they were very good in junior high, but they, I needed to get them to buy in cause they thought I was nuts. Kind of cause I was a little bit, I was very, we were, I knew that we were going to go to big time Jersey, serious wrestling tournaments. And and I knew what, what was waiting for them. I knew the beatdown that was coming, and they didn't. And so I was training them to that level, and they couldn't – they didn't see what was behind the door. They didn't know what was coming three weeks later. So they thought that I was way too intense. They thought that the practices were too tough. It was too wearing down. And I'll, and I'll tell you a funny story. There were um, – Four kids, that's five kids that stuck it out at first on that freshman team that we had at a first year school. And we had a parent who took me aside one day during training. We were doing double, triple sessions uh, early in the season. Pretty standard wrestling fair, um, you know, in high school and whatnot, getting the kids into shape, teaching them stuff. And, and the parent was a principal at another school outside of Princeton and took me aside and said, hey, man, um, I need to talk to you about uh, Bill and or whatever his name was. Uh, but uh, he said, you know, he's been wrestling forever. He's really good. He's won a bunch of these tournaments in junior high. He really likes it. It's really fun for him. And practice right now isn't fun. And he's not having a good time. And I, he doesn't want to stick around. But I think we can get him to stay. I can talk to him. I can get him to stick around on the team if, if, um, if maybe we can, like, dial it down a notch or two. Or like, and kind of, like, scale it back. I think that it'll, it'll tune him. Now is. 21, 22 years old head coach at the time. And I really thought maybe, Hey, I should listen to some feedback. This is important. You know, it's principle. Maybe I'm a little out. And I thought to myself, well, we're going to go to these tournaments. I also trusted my training and my coaches though. What would they do in my position? What are they training their guys for on their competing teams? And I knew, and I, and I thought about it for one second. And once that flip switch, I said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, I like your son a lot. He's a great guy. He's always welcome on our team. But I promise you the easiest day was yesterday. And every single day we're going to be getting tougher. We will not dial it down. We will be dialing it up every single day because they're freshmen in high school. And it's going to get a lot tougher than your first couple of days in freshman year. And it, 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 because they didn't understand that cultural shift, their expectations were here. And the rest of the nation's expectations for high school wrestling are up here. And that kid never came back. He ended up getting a ton of trouble. He was, turns out, being in it. And our four kids, they went for the rest of the year. And I had to get them to buy in. And they bought in because we, we spent – we left everywhere. We went and we did our comparisons to your 35 days out in Europe getting ready. We went – and I took them to Southern. They were training with Frank Molinero every day. We were wrestling Jordan Burroughs in practice, Chris Naughty. All these guys went to you know D1 serious stuff. And I had my freshman wrestling Frank. That's, and, and, and that's how they learned what the real cultural expectation is. And, oh, I'm tired and sore today doesn't go very far in Southern Regional's wrestling room with Frank. Because guess what? Everyone's tired. Everyone's sore. And that's an expectation that doesn't carry water. And so – 
by changing that, getting him out of that environment and making him realize what the next level expectations was. And guess what? Now the stuff that wasn't fun, practice never really gets that fun. But now we started winning. And like when, when I saw Kuhn winning, guess what? He was smiling from ear to ear because winning is fun. Winning Winning, is fun. Winning's fun, you know, but you, you made me think about, uh, about something. You said the, the parent said, oh, my son really loves this. He, he enjoys this sport. But enjoying the sport isn't just enjoying it when, it's, when everything's going your way. You, if you really love what you're doing, you, you have to be willing to take the good with the bad. And, and you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, I mean, it's what I did in, in wrestling. But it's also what I, what I did, you know, in that example when I talked about learning to kayak was, you know, I, I would go out there in January when the air temperature was 22 degrees and my, the, the water was, was flowing because it was moving, but the air temperature was 22 out. It's cold. My hands didn't work. Yeah. At that moment, that wasn't a lot of fun, to tell you the truth. To, just to get my, my personal flotation device off, I had to sit in the water so the temperature of the water actually melted the ice that was, was on my buckle so I could get this off. That wasn't fun. There was a lot of things that I didn't love about that, but I loved the opportunity to get out on the water and see nature from a perspective that nobody else can see it. I love the opportunity to compete all over the world with the best athletes, you know, challenge myself against the best guys in the world. But that meant I had to be willing to do the things that I didn't love to do as well. I mean, it, it how do you, how do you reconcile that? Because it's, it is critical to love what you're doing or else it is, it's not worth it at all because there's times where it is very difficult. It is very arduous and, and just, it, it's exhausting but how much do you have to love what you're doing to to put up with with all the the stuff you don't want to do? I mean, I think obviously you have to love what you're doing a lot, right? But I think I think there's times that kind of like you're alluding to when we might not even love what we're doing, but I think what the answer to that 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 problem is there is you got to trust in in the coach or the trust in the system because there's times when we're daunted and there's times when we're discouraged and there's times we don't want to continue on sometimes. And I think that's where it's helpful to have a team. That's where it's helpful to have teammates, coaches, captains, friends, mentors, people who remind you that that you do love this. And why is it that you're doing it sometimes, at least for me, because because what we do is hard. You know, people talk all the time in UFC about, you know, wrestling is the most important. Wrestling is the toughest sport, this, that. Like, there's nothing easy about what this is as an endeavor it is tough and it is grueling and you guys are trying to do it at the most elite premier level of the grind uh, against greco of, of all things which is the toughest of the toughest i mean that's that's hard and i think sometimes it's easy to get daunted it's it's easy to sometimes lose faith sometimes and and because you know our you know it's kind of like a glass of water sometimes the water is empty and we you need to refill that glass and and, and I think it's helpful that at that, that point, then you trust the coaches because they're fresh because they haven't wrestled all day or all season. They're not cutting weight. They're not burned out. They're fresh enough to keep you fresh when you need it. And that's where that buy-in comes, that trust comes. And I think part of that checking that ego we've talked a lot about, you know, you, you mentioned something earlier about, um, you know, when I had students in class who were, were – asking about you know can we curb the class or why can't we do this or why do we have to read the book which is actually surprisingly a really common complaint that people have they have to actually do the work and read the book um they're not used to that they're not used to that expectation that culture that there is all this extra work in science you have to read the book you can't just read a summary and you know i didn't want to leave a student behind as a, as a teacher everybody else like you said they're like hey we get this can we move on and i said no 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 I want to stay here. I want to clarify this for this one student who has, who doesn't understand this expectation. This is really helpful. I'm not going to leave them behind. I want to fill that water up in that glass again for them. I want to bring them back on board so they understand what we're going for and that we're actually trying to help them. You know, like that that we want them to succeed, and that's why we're doing this. Um, and so I, I guess question, that's 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 a part of the the equation that I think sometimes students don't always look at is is 
we're here to help you succeed, to guide yeah. you, to to show you the way. Um, did you know? Did you not? You know, and was the brochure not clear? You know, you yeah. said you nope. said the like, syllabus. I have a syllabus. Like you, you, you guys don't even, I don't, I don't know everything you guys have on the national team, but it's like, I actually have a syllabus of policies and expectations of this is what it takes. And this, and it's so a good example, right? I say the expectation in this class is that the assigned, the chapter that we'll talk about today, that's on the syllabus, that is the assigned reading that you're expected to have read before you come to class. Now, this is not a new thing I've developed. This is the way it's been for a thousand years in academia. You know, that whatever is on the docket, that's it's like coming to work with them. You're expected to have the meeting material already read when you come to the meeting. And it's just a basic preparation. And so, again, a lot of teachers and professors across the country for decades have started to abdicate that responsibility of, of holding students accountable for that. But like I just keep that very normal, traditional model. And I say this is the expectation. Now, I actually pull people and I collect data in class and I say, how many of you guys actually came to class prepared and read the chapter? And just about everybody honestly reports that they didn't. And I get it. Things are tough. They, there's life happening and stuff. But try. Do something. And a lot of people say they weren't. And so when I show them that, that gives really good feedback. And they say, and then I can show that. And I'll show it to you. Maybe I'll dig it up on my computer in a couple minutes. I'll, I'll graph it. Where do people say that they studied at and then their grades end up panning out and comparing exactly the same so you end up doing exactly how you prepared and it's a really useful lesson for for students to pick up on because it shows them that when 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 i assign those things right for example or a coach has a plan it's for a purpose it actually relates to performance and it's not willy-nilly it's actually pretty well dialed in to relating to performance and the you know, and that I'm trying to help them succeed. And so, you know, when when that comes around, I think, and they they connect with that and can see that, it becomes very helpful as a tool. And so the kind of question then becomes like, you know, are student perspectives sometimes correct, right? Like you talked about this, like, oh, I got to go watch a movie or I need a break or this or that. And, and yeah, like as coaches and teachers, I think it's really important. We need to respect the feedback we're hearing from, from our athletes, from our students. That's always measurable. And we actually respect that a lot. However, you know, I think that one of the things that you mentioned really dials in for me, which is that this isn't a one way street. Like as a coach, as a teacher, I need tools to do my job. And like you said, if you don't want to come to practice or you don't want to do this, you're not willing to train, you're not willing to suffer, then why are you coming to practice like you need thing you can't just make people go win a match you can't run them out there pull their singlet straps up and hold their hand up at the end of a match for them like they need to go out and do that at a certain level and anyways i guess what i'm saying cut to the chase i tell students flat out i look at this as a team effort i want you to succeed and i'm gonna teach you stuff i hope to teach you stuff but here's the thing i can't do that unless you i as you give me the tools I need to succeed in my university, right? USA Wrestling, my my you my university, Cal State, they both expect that we have certain tools to do our job. And as coaches and as teachers, I think the tools oftentimes that we need to do our jobs is the tools of the teamwork from our athletes, from our students. My students have an obligation to come prepared. I, I can't get people to an A level if they don't do their homework ahead of time. You can't get people to a gold medal in Tokyo or at the Worlds if well, they're not doing their homework. Well, I had and, 17 weeks from the time they made the team till they competed. You know, there's 52 weeks in a year. So what did they do that whole time up until the camp started? If the camp is too hard, maybe you didn't prepare enough prior to the camp. Yeah, you know? well, what did you do together with your coach for, for 52 weeks? You know what did you do together, right? And, and, but and, even and, during those seventeen weeks, Rick, you you gotta you gotta realize I only had the guys forty three percent of those those weeks we were in camp or competing. Yeah. And 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 the other fifty seven percent of the time, they had complete autonomy. They had a plan and they had direction, but they had they had that complete autonomy and freedom to do what they needed to do. Uh, during those times, so all I was asking for was 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 
less than half of a percentage of the time to to follow the the national team plan. Well, here's what I would offer back to them, right? And this is what I suggest to my students, right? They have in college, like we've all been there, they have a ton of autonomy to study on their own. And I say, how come nobody comes to my office hours? How come nobody's beaten down doors to come ask questions, clarify stuff? In wrestling, we'd say, come for extra clinic work. You know, how come? Come to practice nope. early. Show up 20 minutes early. The coaches are here. Stay stay an hour late. You, yeah. You, we have coaches here. And so I have, and so we were right as a coach, like, or a teacher, the tools I need to succeed are also, they include students working autonomously. And also they assume that students want to be there, that they want to learn this stuff, that they want to come to my office and ask questions and clarify and get deeper knowledge. And they, but it, more importantly, it, it requires, in, in our case, academically, that they simply come with those, say, the, the assigned readings read. And a lot of times they don't, and I get that and we work through that, but, um, you know, it leads to this situation where they end up oftentimes, and we go through this process all the time in class, they get splashed in the face proverbially with co the cold water of bad grades at first. And I have a system design where we build those grades back up. We teach them how to change their habits, how to change their expectations, how to change their culture of what is too much work. Things they think is too much work, it's not too much work. That's normal. And um, so what we find, and this is sort of nationwide, right, is the question of, are a lot of these sort of student perspectives correct, right? So if you, you can go online and Google like things about student evaluations of classes and it's become this sort of Yelp industry, like people Yelp restaurants. Yeah, yeah. And, um, rate, rate my professor, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, where, you know, people complain that I, I have them read a textbook and, you know, so things like that. Um, you know, there's a science that has studied this and they find out that these student evaluations are actually not accurate at all. And it comes down to several factors. Um, one is how can someone evaluate how good a teaching of a topic is if they're not an expert of the topic, right? So you can't evaluate coaching or teaching unless sometimes you're the coach or the or another peer level coach or a peer level teacher. Because you Because a lot of times the point is, is that you don't realize what you're learning as a student and you don't realize if it's good or bad learning until sometimes years down the road and you can see how much you really did learn. Because when people are being sampled for, let's say their evaluations after a class, it's right before finals after a long stressful semester. How do you think people are gonna feel? Are, do, are you gonna know how much you really gained from that until maybe a semester or two later reflection or maybe later a year or two when you're an alumni looking back and from the world of work and seeing how valuable this opportunity was? Um, so there's that issue in the field where there it's not a valid measure. But it's also not a valid measure for um, because students don't oftentimes know how to how to evaluate what the learning and the teaching is because because you're in the middle of it and they have their experiences are, va are valuable. We want to know if they're having a, you know, a good time or not, because that can help us adjust. But I think that 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 information, right, it reminds us just that, you know, that what we're doing is hard, whether it's world level wrestling or neurobiology, it's hard. And we got to trust the people that are fresh, our instructors, our coaches, they're here to help us. They have a track record of helping people. We've been there, we've suffered, we've lost, and we've learned how to win. And that seasoning gives us the tools to help guide you to learn how to win too. And you're going to be tired, you're going to be depleted, you're going to be discouraged, but you know, you can't lose faith and, and not trust the system and, 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 know, have the humility to ask, say, hey, I'm a little discouraged. What do I got to do to get up? Because that's what we're here to show you. Right. Well, I, I remember, you know, after the world championships, we're still in, uh, we're still in Budapest and we're having dinner and Ellis uh, Coleman got up and he, he, he actually, you know, thanked me for challenging him this year and, and putting him, you know, out of his comfort zone in multiple different ways. He, you know, he, he really, you know, he's, he's from Chicago. I took him to Eagle Creek, Oregon. And it, he, he didn't think he wanted to be in Eagle Creek, Oregon. You know, he wanted to, you know, be in Portland, Oregon, maybe. And, uh, but, uh, you know, he, he was really, you know, expressed his gratitude for, you know, pushing him out of his comfort zone and, and making him experience different things. I mean, you know, just the simple act of connecting with nature and going on hikes and runs every morning, um, you know, is good for your soul. It's good for connecting you with with nature. Um, 
but you know, I mean, they they did a lot of challenging things throughout that camp, you know, and, and they had a lot of fun doing it when they when they realized, you know, that it was a great experience and maybe an experience that they never are going to have another opportunity to have that experience, you know, and, and as Ellis was looking back on this, he was like, I've kept myself from experiencing these things because it was out of my comfort zone. I, and I don't human nature tell, dictates that we don't want to get out of our comfort zone. I mean, that's just, that's just pure human nature. I want to be comfortable. I mean, look at the American lifestyle. I mean, we're gluttonous now. I mean, it's like we have so many, amenities we don't even we don't even have to get in our car and, and go get food anymore we can have it delivered to us i mean it's 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 this consumerism culture of you know i'm the customer this is what i want and and it, maybe they are the customer i mean they're 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 paying tuition to go to your school does that mean they get to demand the 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 terms of how you teach no Right. It's so I mean, let's let's talk well, about that. A what, little bit. what are they a customer of? They're a customer of education. And that means education means learning something new. And like you just said, learning something new means being pushed. It requires moving beyond our comfort zone, whether that's on our own or whether someone's pushing us. So if we're but not way, pushing somebody if the out of their comfort zone, then we're not doing our jobs. Well, yeah, that's exactly the thing, right? So, so why are you a customer? Why are you paying for something if you don't want to grow beyond what you're comfortable at? In fact, you're not a customer then. And so it really changed, you, you, you know, there's a problem. Administrations across the country are looking at students as, as customers, but that model is, is not a very valid one when, when, the, when the market that you're in is a market in which people want, want to learn. And they, that is, they're saying implicitly, I want to grow. And if you're going to grow, that means there's no, there's not really no, always an easy growth process that, and the best growth process is come through, through challenge and, 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 and growing beyond our comfort zone that requires somehow getting outside where we're comfortable. And I think you hit the nail on the head, man. Like we, we don't, we do have a culture that, that is hinged upon being comfortable. I mean, it's great. I mean, we're in warm, comfortable clothes and, and heated houses. We're not cavemen living in freezing areas, but, but, you know, we've become so comfortable. Our, you know, our kids are not always resilient to failures, setbacks, because we want to keep them comfortable. We don't want to challenge them um, in, in schools all the time, right? We don't want to have to struggle through bad classes all the time. We want to push kids through. They get in grades inflated. They teach to the test. There's this national issue. How do we increase our math and science scores? We need to challenge our students, right? We can't have them stay in that comfort zone of, I don't want to do algebra and geometry because it's, it's hard and it, and it makes me uncomfortable. No, sorry. You're going to have to learn some algebra and geometry because guess what? That opens up an awesome world of learning how to fly an airplane or dive or, you know, do all sorts of cool stuff. And, 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 and so I think that that takes bravery on teachers' parts, courage on parents and administrators' parts um, to deal with complaints from students, from parents, those types of things. But um, to that require – that give us the ability to take students to their real full potential because we love them. We care about them. We want to see them have their hand raised, whether it's in science or life or wrestling or whatever. We want them to be champions. And we know they can do it because we believe in their potential. And so, you know – you know, comfort is king in America right now. And I don't know that that's a good thing. We do not praise discomfort. We don't praise someone for making someone uncomfortable. We don't praise some athlete or some student for being uncomfortable all the time. Because oftentimes we don't have the courage to put them there. Um, but there, and, but there is no growth without struggle. There's yeah. no growth without failure. Um, like, it's remarkable. I mean, if you think about it, right, what's the thing that a lot of kids are saying these days? They say the struggle is real, right? And like, that's a lament. How about like not lamenting that? How about saying, embracing it? Yeah, the struggle is real. Hell yeah, brother. Damn right, the struggle is real. Yeah, let's get some. Let's get some struggle, you know? Like, good, like, good, Jocko. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Jocko's just good. <laughs> yeah. 
like we should we should praise the discomfort we should lament that struggle as long as it's in a healthy way right but like we don't always know how much is really needed to succeed at a premier level of of elite level unless we've been there right nor we, do we really know how how hard it really is to get it it's really hard to make discoveries in science to 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 win medals at your level um you know you know and and guess what what you're doing to prepare is probably not enough. If you if you're an athlete and you're and you're comfortable, guess what? You're definitely not doing what you need to prepare. You shouldn't be that comfortable when you're training. You shouldn't be. I mean, that was shit. That was the story in Rocky Three. He got too comfortable training. That's uh, that's right. And and like, you know, I mean, it's just it's like you know, going onto the mat. It's like how do you how do you feel like every world championship that I ever competed in or or, or Olympics? It was like, how do you feel? I feel terrible. Like I'm, my body's beat up. My something hurts. You know, there. You know, whether it's you know a wrist, an, an elbow, a, a rib, uh, whatever it is. It's like I don't feel good. You know, but I feel prepared and I feel ready to go fight. And I, why do I mean? Why do you want to? Like you're never like if you if you understand you are never going to step on the mat feeling a hundred percent. You are yeah. never going to be uh, ideally like, wow, this, like if you are, then you're probably not going to perform very well because you didn't prepare properly. Yeah. And the thing is, is like, I don't want to be like misunderstood as like bashing on kids or anything. Like, I don't think this is always even the kid's fault. I think it's just the system that they've kind of been implicitly raised in. It's like, I think that there's this sort of systemic sort of narcissism afoot that's assuming that we're always right and the teachers are wrong because there's kind of this dearth or this absence of real experiential wisdom because that only comes from failing and you can only fail if you've really tried and you can only really try if you're pushed beyond your comfort zone and so that's not happening a lot our schools aren't our our, our school districts our, 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 our systems aren't really offering that to a lot of students a lot of times and so they don't necessarily have all those tools and that's not always their fault and you know that's but we're here to to help you you know what them. you know what though it's not their fault but it's their problem and they've got to figure out how to deal with that problem you yeah know, but there's, we're here there's a help. lot of things there's a lot of things that aren't your fault it isn't your fault that you were raised by a single mother it isn't your fault that you know you, your your family was broke but it's it's still your 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 problem you have to figure out how to overcome all that adversity no matter whose fault it is it's still your problem that you you have to well, navigate and and deal yeah. with. Yeah, but we all have problems, and what I'm saying is that that might be their problem, maybe. But here's the thing: they don't have to solve that on their self. They can ask us for help. They can come. To, we're here to help. We we know the road. We know the path. If you want to know if you're training enough, come ask us. We'll tell you. If you want to know if there's more that you can do to train, come knock on my door. Will help you. I'll do, tell you if you're. Do you if have supplementary? Do you have supplementary reading? If somebody yeah. wanted to get more information, do you have articles, books, videos yeah. you could send them to? Yeah. If How many students ask? How many students actually come and go? Well, you know, you know what? About... I didn't quite get what the textbook said. Do you have? Do you have another document or book yeah. that I could read? Does Does that happen? Uh usually from about three out of 50 students a class, the top three. And, and guess what? Those are not the three top talented students. Those are the three top scoring students because they have the motivation to ask and they have the humility to ask and they have the motivation to want to do better. And because they do those things, they end up becoming the top three students in class and their scores. That doesn't mean they're always the most talented, by the way. No, it, it, well, look at, look at, look at sports and athletics. You know, yeah. I mean, you see the guys that have the most talent and, and, you know, it's, it's like hard work beats talent. If talent doesn't work, like it's cliche, yeah. but it's, but it's so true. There's so many guys that have all the talent in the world and just God given abilities. And they're just blessed with that. And, and they never had to struggle because it came easy. And now they're at a, at a level where everybody's at their level or maybe even higher than their level. And now they don't know, they don't know how to struggle. They, well, that's like, my point. It's, it's yeah. like, they think it's a bad thing. They think it's, it's wrong. <laughs> I shouldn't be feeling this pain and adversity. 
It's like, that's why, what why? this is so uncomfortable? Why that's am what I I'm... feeling like this? <laughs> well, that's what I've been saying for the whole conversation. That That's that cultural shift. That's the difference in next. You think that that, that that was too much when really that's just enough, just enough. And there's actually more that we can push beyond that. And that's where I'm saying, like, if you don't know if this is a good feeling or a bad feeling, tell the coach what you're feeling. Tell him, hey, I, am I training enough? Am I overtraining? I'm really concerned that I'm overtraining right now. Or, hey, do, is there more I could do? I just need you to get a calibration, right? Like, th that's the, the onus of responsibility there is on the on, on student, the athlete. You know, in high school, maybe not. No. At college, at a U.S. national team, yeah. Yeah, we're these are grown ups. That's your responsibility. State, you know, yeah. Yeah, like 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 you're a grown up. You're in college, or you're on the U.S. national team. You are responsible for for a level of your own accountability, and you need to ask if you're not sure. I think it's a great message. Like, if you don't know if you're training enough, or if you feel like you are, or, or you want to know but, if there's but, more. But you they're ask. they're getting messages from other people that that aren't experts that aren't in their field and they're, they're like you know they're, they're getting confirmation biasy is what well, they're getting yeah. you know i think i'm training too hard i'm sure you are like i would well, never train that hard well that yeah. that person doesn't want to be the best in the world well th yeah and so i so I, i've had to talk to i've talked with my students in lab that i that i train um you know in research and stuff and i tell them very clearly i'm like look you know do not compare yourself to other students in the program because we're going to work harder because we have different goals. We're trying to do different things. Our research is a little different. Maybe it requires a little bit longer effort. Maybe it requires a little bit different things because we might use different tools or different methods or techniques. So you can't compare yourself to other students because they might only want to get a master's, but we're training you to go out and get a PhD. And you, if you cannot compare what we're doing, because I promise you, you're going to feel bad because I'm going to push you harder than what the other people yeah, but, but you can't compare yourself to anybody you can only compare yourself to where you were yesterday and yeah. where you want to be and there's some gap in the middle there that you have to you have to transverse that gap somehow it's like here's where i want to be here's what i was yesterday i can only compare myself to to myself well, yeah, and so I had a student uh, we were talking to, and they're and I was getting about prepared for a test or something coming up, and they're saying, you know, uh, and I'm like, well, what are your study plans for this weekend? Well, I'm not going to have time to do that, and we have a lot of students here who work full time and all that, and I said, well, well, you know, what do you got going this weekend? Like, you got to work or something with your job, and they're like, well, no, there's this there's this punk rock concert out in L.A. and it's a really excited about it, and I want to go see it, and you know, we're going to go there, we're going to have a good time, we're going to drink, and you know. It's going to be fun. And, you know, it's college. I like, go out and have fun, whatever. But like, you know, I, I we had this conversation. I said, well, you know, um, it's a very short semester we're in. We got about five weeks left. Maybe this isn't the best time to go drinking and partying on the weekend. Maybe this is the time to really dial in for this really big test that you struggled with last time that now we got coming up right around the corner. And and the the, the conversation followed suit where it was like, well, yeah, but I want to be balanced and I want to have a good balance. And I said, well, okay, fair enough. But what you're going to have a balance of is good grades and bad grades. You're going to have a balance of bad grades and, or, or, or you're not, you're or definitely good not. results and bad results. Yeah. You're going to be and inconsistent. So, and we, and we see this all the time. We see this, you know, in our program where guys have great results and then they have terrible results and, you know, and, and there's I mean, we all have times yeah, of course, we all do. And there's certain times where right after the semester, maybe I should go get drunk and go to that punk show. That sounds like <laughs> a great thing to do. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that band's not in town. Well, sorry. You know, I I don't know. There's yeah. a time and a place for everything. Well, that's what I was talking about, that uh, changing that cultural expectation, right? Like, so that's been the norm, right? But we you know, that's part of my message to, to students and, and stuff is that like, like you said, is, is maybe you don't do that because maybe that band's not back in town the next after the test. But like, but maybe we just become OK with missing that because we have a different set of goals and we understand that there's expectations that are required to meet those goals. And they might be different than what everybody else has. And everyone else might go to that concert or have a good time. But 
we got to understand that their standards cannot be ours. And that was that difference, whether it was high school kids I was training or, or world level guys that, that you're doing or, or scientists that I'm working with, um, you know, like those we can't hold other people's goals to be our own because like you said, people are like, oh, that's enough training or this or that. And it's like, no, you know, like, no. And I, I mean, my mom drives me nuts. She always tells me, Rick, you got to start work, stop working out so hard. You're going to hurt your body, you know, cause she's a mom and she doesn't want me to get hurt. She doesn't understand that, that the high level of what she thinks is too intense of a workout. That's just normal. That's a good, healthy thing. And I, and I kind of have to be gentle and push them back a little bit, but other people's expectations cannot be adopted into ours, especially if we have different goals. And if, and, and, you know, we're going to have to up that when we want to comp- cl- change levels. And, you know, like, I really think it's just that discomfort needs to be welcomed. It needs to be praised. And and I think we need to pray, embrace the idea of a slow growth process. It's like planting an oak tree or a garden. You know, you got to water it, but you don't see it grow the next day. We got to know it's going to grow a few years later. And like, you're going to have some setbacks. You're going to have some struggles. You're not going to see the growth from all the hard work you're putting in at first, but it will come. And, you know, we've padded and insulated these kids, not just from failure, but from the challenge and, and from that, that which, which they can build that resilience, that grit, that, that defines winners and, you know, defines the kind of person like Adam Kuhn who can have draw upon that grit to go through a really tough summer of setbacks and growth and see that the growth is good because he has a learning attitude and that knows when that when the setbacks happen that that's the rip in the muscle that will build into a bigger stronger muscle like we need that resilience and if we're insulating from that discomfort and, and we're getting reinforced from people who are telling us that that's good to be comfortable and it's bad we shouldn't be discomforting or that we shouldn't be uncomfortable, then they're telling us not to grow. They're telling us not to learn. And I saw the opposite. Not to tear your... that muscle fiber and grow that muscle. And, and, and you know, I, I think we're, 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 I think we, we've, we've exa- exhausted this topic, but I'm going to leave with, with a story that one of my coaches used to share with me. And he, he talked about these, these two farm farmers and, and, you know, their, their, their farms were next to one another and, and they both had sons and uh, one farmer came out, you know, one day and he, he said to, to the other guy, he said, man, I, I, I see your boys out there every single day. I mean, they're, they're plowing, they're raking, they're, they're tilling the ground. I mean, they are working so hard. He says, he says, listen, you don't need to work those boys that hard to, to raise a farm. And he said, I'm raising young men. And that you know that's that's the story you know that's the moral of the story is you know he's developing character in 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 his sons and uh and resiliency and uh you know he's putting that struggle into him he's not he's not hurting them he he's yeah. he's loving his 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 children because he you know and i and i you know i feel like i tried to raise my kids like that i certainly did not give them easy roads you know and you know, we had, we had very simple rules in our house, and it was like, you, you can do what you want to do once your responsibilities are taken care of. You know, I mean, it's like, I'm hungry. Did your animals eat? You know, I want to do this. Did you clean your stalls? You know, it was like, you know, whatever whatever the question was, it was like, you know what the expectations are. You know what your responsibilities and your duties are. Have you done those things? Okay. Go enjoy yourself. Go have fun. And uh, I, I think that's, you know, that's a good story for, you know, what we've been talking about today. Yeah. And I think that like, you know, I think that that's a great way to wrap it up because sort of what you were talking about with Ellis and everything, I think that, you know, if we can end on like a, a really positive note of encouragement for, you know, anybody who might be listening or watching or, you know, students, athletes, whatever, it's like, like this works out. This system works and, you know, like I get feedback from students and I'll, t- I'll sample them at different times through the semester. And at first they lash out and when they do wrong or they do badly in tests, they, they say it's my fault or they, they say I'm doing a bad job or whatever. And, um, 
but through the growth process and the introspection and, and the, the maturity that develops, by the end of the semester, they realize that when they do that work and they, and, they, and they commit to doing their side of the equation, coming prepared and doing all those things that I need to have done so that I can teach them uh, effectively to get A's, because we don't care about C's and B's, we want A's, um, then they get that and we, they get there at the end. And I get letters like you did from from Ellis talking. And, well, and, and I and I got a chance to read some of those um, those and, letters. And they say thank you. And they say, you know, you've changed my outlook on test taking. You know, I look at every test now as an opportunity to earn points, not a chance to get dinged for points, but it's a chance for me to get points. And you know, and they say thank you for going above and beyond and inspiring to look in, in neuroscience in a different way, but change the study habits that allow them to succeed in everything in other classes. And so, like, you know, that this this works and and that change happens and they realize that that there's that that growth is real. And 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 I think that we can work as a team between student and teacher and and, and everybody wins more. Um, so I mean, it really does work out, and it requires work on both of our sides. It's not easy for them, and it's not easy for us. But we can make each of each other's lives easier if we can work together. Well, thanks for your time, Rick. I appreciate you coming on as usual, and uh, we'll do this again real soon. Now that I'm back in country. Well, hey, congratulations, man! You guys had those big medal, big trajectory for you guys, man. I'm so excited. You guys are. Man, Tokyo, you guys are, I'm excited, man. You guys are doing great. So congrats. I appreciate Thanks for it. making me proud.